Oh, shout it. Step into the light. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So I'm live. I'm live. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my name's Klaus. Uh, um, I run an organization called Hack Humanity. And we've just been here uh, nearly for the last 36 hours. I think we're at about 32 hours in so far. We've been breaking out into teams around this mission of how do we create one home. Um, we, we rally together seeing our fellow uh, human beings uh, suffering in looking for new homes. There's 59 million people on this planet who are displaced uh, from their home. And not a week ago, there's a big rally here in uh, the UK, people walking in solidarity, solidarity and standing up and protesting. Why are our leaders not listening and doing something uh, about this? And we're a team of talented individuals and we've come together uh, in a type of event called a hackathon, which is like a marathon of creativity and innovation. We've brought ourselves together for the last uh, 32 hours so far, um, and this is what we've come up with. So we've got uh, Shelley, who's going to give us uh, the first pitch. Come in, Shelley. Uh, and this one won't be on video. <laughs> okay, and so this one will not be uh, on video, it's just audio only. So my name is Shelley Taylor and we are here to uh, pitch an idea that we came up with a week ago. I got here yesterday and recruited two more members of my team, so I'll present to you Serene, Francesca and Ahmed. And I will quickly go through because we have five minutes our idea, which is a refugee aid app. So I don't think we need to really go into what the problem is, but there are, as Klaus said, 59 million people or 69 million people. Like, 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 who are trying to find a new safe place to live. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. What happens to most of these people, um, we've learned, is that they show up on a border somehow by boat or train or car in the back of a trunk. And most of what they have is just the clothes on the back. And many or most of them have a phone with them that they got before they left on this health journey. So the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, the solution we've come up with is an app, which is a single point of contact for the refugees from the moment they arrive in whatever place they arrive in, where they can get all the information they need about where to go. And that could be an asylum center, it could be for medical care, a place to connect with other people within an app, like a social network for refugees, support and assistance. And that can be donated by um, individuals or aid organizations. And then it will be a single point of contact for people like us who want to give our support to refugees, all within a single app. And the, the, the thing that kind of pulls it all together is a web portal where we allow NGOs and charities in order to give them a way to communicate with these groups of people wherever they are clustered at any given moment in time and share their uh, resources with refugees. So my company has already built a platform that is an app creation platform, so for us it's easy to get in there and create an app that has these new features and functionalities that are based on the geolocation of information and resources so that all of the information that you need is relevant to where you are at any given point in time if you're a refugee. A uh, social network, as I said, and the A will be classified by type and ontology, which is logical, medical, um, housing, clothing, and asylum. We'll create this web-based management, content management system. These are just some of the screens that we've done as a mock-up, but because we have this platform that allows us to relatively easily skin, we will be able to change the look and feel of this. This is just what we put together for today quickly. In this case, we focused on an example related to giving people jobs wherever they are. This is actual screen from our content management system that we've already built that shows how you can, as a Red Cross, you can delegate different permissions to people in various locations of the Red Cross, and these people can have the ability to send push notifications and email messages to the people who are using the app. So we started out um, with this idea a week ago, and uh, my friend Serene, um, who's the 
cinnamon uh, grants, offered to help raise the money. I'm contributing whatever I've already built in terms of my technology platform. Um, clearly, we'll have to add some additional features for the purpose of this app, but we've got all the infrastructure already, and we were, we're going to do this as a private sector initiative, and so things can go much more quickly and um, efficiently because we already have people who are working who are happy to keep working on just another project for us. So we'll do the project management, we'll take care of um, fundraising, and we will do the stakeholder, um, NGO stakeholder outreach. What we're looking for today is between 40 and 55, 40 and 45,000 pounds. The way we would use this money is for the additional software development, um, which um, uh, we'll need in order to create some special um, security features and various things that are not part of our existing platform. Uh, to cover the maintenance, hosting, updates, future development, um, we want to fund four part-time roles, um, one of whom we would like to have be Ahmed, who would be our refugee advocate. Um, and the things that these people will do is to help build awareness. He would be our helping us with the refugee-facing part, create the links with NGOs, which is something Francesca has experience in her work, and volunteer management. And Serene will help us with the fundraising. The timing is the first two weeks we want to raise this money through an Indiegogo, through private uh, contributions. It's not a tax, um, it's a tax benefit because we're not a nonprofit. We're just going to run this amongst our friends and family in order to make this work. We expect that we can get the app out there with both the whole back end and have four partners on board. NDOs, I've already been talking with the Red Cross, the Free Red Cross, and they're very excited about this project. So in eight to 12 weeks, we'll have this out there in the hands of refugees with plenty of resources on them. That's fine. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Well, in the six months, what we expect is to see the up in the re refugee um, points where people cluster so that it will be just like Facebook or WhatsApp passed along to will hear about it. Um, so we'll achieve that, that. then there's not enough critical mass of people who are using the app. On the NGO side, in that time, we probably can get, um, in the first few weeks, we'll get four major partners. We already are talking to two of them, so we should get the other four pilot um, NGOs on board, and then I think it will be quite easy for our volunteer staff and our part-time employees to spread the word throughout the European countries to these organizations as to how they can use our tools. So I would imagine that we would probably have an adoption rate of between 10 and 12 per country of NGOs and charities who are trying to disseminate the kind of information that could be used in this app. Um, just to give an example, we had my first conversation with the British Red Cross was an introduction. Three days later, they had a whole team of people on the telephone talking to me about how they could use this. They were so excited. I mean, they're, for, they're international, they're, they're digital people, as well as the head of the refugee program. So it's clearly a need for this. Um, in terms of self-sufficiency, there's no business model here. So what I would hope at the end of six months is to let uh, some nonprofit either um, be created in the during this period and let this go for adoption to someone. My company is happy to continue maintaining it at infinitum at uh, no cost, but we're, because we're a startup, we can't just, we can't handle all the initial startup costs, but we're happy to do all the hosting maintenance and that on a long-term basis. So I don't think there's ever gonna be a revenue model for it, but there is definitely the opportunity to just do this as a turnkey solution to a charity that wants to take on the responsibility. So basically this will, uh, this will create a tool, you'll be able to support the tool in the background and it will launch it into the environment and the environment will be able to benefit from it, but there won't be any additional costs. It, no, it's uh, self-sustaining. We've launched okay. many apps before and they just keep going. I mean, I have to pay the hosting cost, but it's all very insignificant in terms of that. So, any other questions? Um, I, I actually I do have okay. a question because I, I mean if this is successful, 
it will need a there'll, there'll be a lot of requests for more stuff yeah to come to, to come so presumably the available and ready to do that as well. I'm committing my company, my current investors are very excited about this project as well. I think we can absorb whatever cost is because our typical model with our app creation platform that we've already created is that for a small minimum monthly fee, we continue to add features on at no additional cost to our clients because it's switching them on and off. So it's unlikely that we couldn't continue just adding the additional features over time based that, on the need. Yeah. But if it is successful, that would better. Yeah, so that's there'll, that's be, a there'll be problem. something that everybody needs, and then yeah, that's a good problem to have. And I think at that point as well, then some charity might just want to adopt it and take it in house, and we will continue to be the the partner managing the technology part of it. So. Very good. Thanks. Next, we have got one pack. This is short deck. Yeah, it's houses. Are you okay to be filmed, Pat? Yeah. Streamed? Yeah. It's five there. Yeah. Well, four and a bit. <laughs> All right, class, go. Your time starts now. We live? Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> so, the overall uh, picture here is how do we create one home uh, that works for everybody on this planet? <clears throat> so, I want to read out a quote from Buckminster Fuller, who's an absolute inspiration of mine. Never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something, to change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. It is now highly feasible to take care of everybody on Earth at a higher standard of living than any have ever known. It, is no, it no longer has to be you or me. Selfishness is unnecessary. War is obsolete. It is a matter of converting our high technology from weaponry to living room. So over this weekend, we've come up with a, uh, a modular and uh, integrated system whereby how do we go about creating one home? And while we're addressing the specific need, which is critical for uh, refugees, we're also working for the whole world about how do we design more efficient systems. We've got a world where we're working towards open collaborative models on uh, digital infrastructure, on physical infrastructure, and uh, social and cultural infrastructure. Uh, we see this with tools like uh, Wikipedia, uh, the common transition of uh, physical uh, properties. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about right now is uh, a physical pack, uh, all of the gear that you need to survive and thrive in this wild world. Uh, and then we've got other people who are going to be talking about the past uh, campus and then the story, the narrative, that, um, this new story that hangs it all together. So specifically about the pack, yeah, everything you need to survive and thrive in this wild world. <clears throat> so. If we look at what's going on um, in the situation for a, uh, a refugee, um, most cru crucial item that migrants and refugees 
carries a smartphone. This is coming up over and over again in the news. Um, beyond being uh, safe physically, you have a need to communicate and organize and work out where you're going next to um, work out what, where am I going to get a, uh, a home somewhere which has got good prospects. Uh, every human being wants the right to uh, learn and to live a life where you can be a contribution doing something um, that leverages your talent. Um, so, yeah, 59 million human beings are displaced. Um, what is their critical gear? How are they going to live and, live and survive and travel? Um, so, one of the problems at the moment is we've got a ton of people who are really stepping up and wanting to be a contribution in the world, um, but they're actually stuffing things up because it's not done in a coordinated way. You can create more noise in the system. Um, for example, a whole lot of people um, got in self driving cars and drove to LA with um, all of this clothing and it's not actually not with what is needed and there was no space for it and, it and it just slowed things down. So let's get uh, coordinated about what gear uh, we put together and give to people. So um, uh, we, we had this weekend uh, an actual refugee come and tell his real story and this is everything he owns. This is gear, his gear uh, on the right. Um, and this is the journey he has moved through from Syria to Turkey, uh, to Greece, to Algeria, to Libya on a boat. Uh, can't quite read the rest of this, this right here, but it's been a, a harrowing journey through lots of different uh, modes of transport and obstacles to get past. I want to step in and uh, mention a framework by Vinay Gupta, uh, who's come up with a model of um, how to prevent this, the most common six ways to die, which are uh, injury, illness, too hot, too cold, uh, hunger, uh, and first, and so we want to design a model here um, for what is the gear to mitigate all of these risks, and then beyond um, beyond um, surviving, we're doing this in a in a modular, horizontally integrated way for how would all the gear work for an individual, for a small group, and for a for a mission leader, um, and we want to do it so it's a collection of new gear and also collect recycled gear and be able to um, pack these together. Yeah. Um, so there's your survival, your basic kind of kit, and this is not rigorously tested of what the gear is right now, but this is the intent that we will do as coming next steps. Uh, and then beyond that, you need to communicate, you need to get set up with a, um, uh, a SIM uh, in your local location as well as the phone. Um, the business model is inspired by um, the one laptop per child um, initiative, which um, was a massive collaborative effort to bring people together to drive the price down to $100 for a laptop worldwide, and also the Tom's model of buy one, give one, where we have somebody who's wealthy buy one, and someone who oh, cannot have one, this one. Uh, looking to speak with these partners, um, and our next steps is to make a curated pack, uh, and then consult with specialists about what's the actual gear into it. So, that's it. Okay. Is there an ask? Is there an ask? Yeah. Um, it would be introductions to specialists in uh, these organisations. Amazon, Kathmandu, Decathlon, IKEA, Red Cross, uh, Google Android, uh, three or similar providers that would like to step up and be part of this initiative. Who would, I mean, who would actually be put the pack together and distribute it? So I would work uh, with fitting and would bring a, a team of specialists together. The ask would be uh, for me uh, to have the funding to work full time on this with a small team. Um, that would look like uh, th the three of us uh, for three months and I'd say we want 25k for our working costs for that. Okay. Any other questions? And I think we've seen that volunteers can be mobilized to pack bags and stuff as well. Yeah, that, yes, one of the other things we thought about is that actually a lot of the refugees might want to be involved in the effort uh, of assembling this, and this is a way that they could uh, earn a livelihood by being part of this uh, workforce for years. Gathering all of the uh, equipment, forming the packs, and then making those distributable. Well, that's huge. <laughs> That's, that, that, that 
puts it onto a completely different dimension because you're actually solving a different part of the I don't know if that was in your Maslow triangle but actually <laughs> giving activity and sustainable activity that's already uh it's quite I think it's quite interesting mm -hmm. yeah and then the, the next about, one of our later stages our components around campus actually is integrated in thinking about um, equipping um, refugees or former refugees with uh, work, so that's coming. Um, my question is, where um, are you thinking of sending these packs? Um, so at the moment, there's uh, five uh, zones in the world which have 95% of all refugees. So we identify what are the critical sites across this next three month plan. Uh, we don't have that rigor rigorous work done right now, but we will work out exactly where to send them. Yeah. I mean, on, on Sundays, I think, particularly, I think on TV, um, if you're like me, I tend to just sort of collapse on a Sunday and vegetate in front of the TV. Um, and you get people like, uh, you know, famous actors and stuff who are asking for one pound, three pounds. And um, often it's, it's to provide a hat and gloves. I've seen hat and gloves for kids and then, you know, going through the winter. So, so some of this must already exist as well. Um, there there, there, there must some, already yeah. be people doing this. In, There's some, but it's not, it's not joined up uh, in this kind of way. And yeah, we'd like to make it uh, very efficient uh, and matching exactly what is needed. Plus the logistics of getting the right thing to the right people at the right time is not done. Uh, and people People are creating a lot of noise in the system by having uh, good intentions, uh, but not doing, uh, not providing what's actually needed, slowing down other aid workers. Okay. Cool. Next team. Thanks, Claire. One pass. We're streaming live on YouTube. Are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Streaming live? Maybe I should have put out this job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not in charge. from the one hat stage it's kind of like that's put more on the ground what's required then one pass is uh, very very important and often dangerous according especially to the journey we heard from Armin that process the transit so one pass addresses all the needs well it doesn't address all the needs but it targets a very specific need which has been identified which is all about um, current situation with uh, transportation where there's, it's very ad hoc, there's boats, there's uh, the journey that we've had stories of, um, like many others, I'm sure, um, are not what needs to be happening in a world with potential for international <laughs> communication and collaboration beyond anything that's ever been known. So, the problem is that basically in the EU law there's a specific article which 
but recently it's actually been updated. And Pan, Pan Swasling, the statistician, made this wide, widespread knowledge, which requires airlines, commercial airlines, to pay for the repatriation of any failed asylum applicants. So if I'm a refugee, I can't get on a plane because I don't have visa, maybe, but the, the plane company will not take responsibility for the cost of repatriation when and if I don't get asylum. So it's kind of like the governments and the legal infrastructure have, uh, European legal infrastructure has outsourced the responsibility to commercial airlines which cannot take that responsibility. So there's this Let Them Fly uh, new project, I think, from Sweden. Um, you can read about it on The Guardian, they also recognised this and they thought we need to do something about it, hashtag let them fly, explore that. So the solution that we thought of is literally, like we said at the start, using the existing frameworks um, of our society rather than like building something new. Um, if there was just a third party organisation to provide travel insurance, which would allow refugees safe passage out of their crises, um, this would kind of just take away the risk because they're juggling with responsibility. They're saying, you know, I don't want the responsibility, no, I don't want the responsibility. And if there's a third party which says, okay, we will provide insurance goes through the legalities of that and really assists the process. Well, this is how this is how it works. Okay, so the idea is that um, the big block for people being able to move from one place of uh, where they're in danger to a place of safety is that the airlines are liable for repatriating them if it goes wrong. So what we want to do is to take away that, um, that risk and insure against that risk. So we're a travel agent that provides a very special kind of travel insurance for asylum seekers. Um, so step one is while they're still in the at their point of origin, is to give them a temporary ID, which is a blockchain based ID we can then add information to it. So we can add, for example, a photograph, a uh, copy of any kind of state ID that they have, all of the documents that might get destroyed normally in transit, um, that we get those all defined and added to this ID on the blockchain. We then get all the evidence we can get about uh, their situation and their, their status and their, their, the danger that they're facing. And then we do a assessment of whether they are likely to be able to uh, get asylum in, a, in, a, in another country. If we deem that they are likely to be able to get that asylum, we then arrange insurance to recover to cover the cost of repatriation if it's necessary. And uh, we add a significant of that to the blockchain as well. Um, and then we, uh, then we also arrange where they're going to be met and by who. In, well, Marcus is going to come on to this in a, in a while, but this, this whole concept of the one campus, a sort of wealth center. Um, That's time. So, yeah. <laughs> so basically, it means that they, they now have a, a guaranteed way to go through the process yeah. and a very high chance that they will be accepted. So you can add, answer more in the questions. Yeah. <laughs> we just get to the next slide. And then they can fly. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have to be very tight on time because Army has limited time and we want to get to everyone. Okay. This is me. <laughs> 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 Did you have a question? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying. I mean, I was, I, I may have looked like I was sort of over here, but I'm, I, I was listening, and I'm kind of one of the things that um, I definitely think there's a 
opportunity to do something over here that, would, that, that takes that piece of the danger of boat journeys and stuff, yeah. deaths on the boat, and kind of completely takes that out of the picture. And I was just, in that video, it says that the cost of the journey from like Cairo to wherever it is, Athens or something like that, is 300 euros, right? And the cost of the journey on the boat is a thousand euros. That's right. And um, and I'm just kind of wondering, you know, on on, on normal airlines, the cost of a return return trip is pretty much the same as the cost of a one way ticket. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm not sure there must be something that can be done there. And while you while you were talking, I mean, I'm just you know, obviously, I wish you had more time. I think this is a, this is a very good one. There's a lot of detail that needs to be talked out of it. But while you were talking, I was thinking, you know, actually, travel agent, why not just become a travel company and charter the boat and do the business and actually do it, actually, you know, by almost on the journey, you could do a lot of the processing. And you could kind of take out a lot of the admin by doing it yourself. Do you know what I mean? Rather, because if you use airlines and boats and other services, then you kind of have to fit into their way of doing it. Whereas if yeah. you could actually get a ship, are you with me? <laughs> Not yeah. A ship, you know, it sounds it sounds crazy, but if you could actually get a ship or get a plane, yeah, yeah, and do it yourself. So, you know, get the people up there and you know do that whole thing. I mean, probably make a business out of it. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you're a not-for-profit charity, whatever, I think that it, you know, I really think there's something that could be done. A here. crowdfunded yeah. plane. No, <laughs> we agree. It's definitely it's sustainable. I'm sure that is yeah. no choice. Because yeah. 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 they're spending so yeah. much money. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, what we're doing here is concentrating on the um, on, on the on the difficult part, which seems to be that insurance. Well, that, that's and what I'm thinking. If you actually required. if you actually chartered the plane. And in order to charter a plane, you need some cash flow. Yeah. You don't actually need to invest money. You just because you're going to make a profit out of the, and you're going to have, you're going to build in the insurance into that, and you're going to have some time on the journey to do some of the pros, you know, hand out the kits and all of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'd be quite, uh, quite interesting because I thought about the insurance aspect, and I'm kind of thinking if you if you do it if if you can do it yourself, it's rather than do it with another, the insurance, you don't need to do the insurance in a way because you just charge double. You know, you say like it's 500 pounds instead of 250 yeah. pounds and 250 pounds goes into the sink to cover the, you know, the costs of repatriation. And if the planes are going back, you know, you just put people back on the planes in the other direction. I mean, it sounds simple. There's, there's two, there's just, just the final piece which I think is very important as well is from a societal, we identified the benefits from a societal benefit perspective as well. There's two, there's uh, there's a reduction in the cost of controlling borders significantly, which is potentially, which could, which could impact on societal level. Um, and also, in theory, if you're if you're doing a lot of the assessment up front, adjacent to, to the area of need, the origin of the refugees, a lot of the work being done then to identify the process, then uh, it should speed up. That, uh, that refugee getting into work quicker um, and being, you know, getting the right to remain sort of should be far quicker at the other end. So it's a reduction of cost there, we believe, for society too. And the other thing, of course, is it's taking the taking it away from the organised criminals and again, bringing it to a legitimate, safe mode, safe mode of transport. I, I, I just think this could be a real, real winner. You know, if you think about the, I mean, I, if you think about the, the, the ship. That came from Turkey to Gaza. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? In terms of PR, what happened there and everything. So, and and unfortunately, PR is extremely important to get, you know, the right messages out. I mean, speaking of Concordia, would be a perfect yes. first one to go to because they have a lot of bad PR that they have. They just really? Costa Concordia, the one that fell over on the side. Oh, okay. They have a lot of bad PR to overcome, and if they could just dedicate once in a while, there's probably a lot of grants and people like that could as well do that. Klaus, let's get a bloody lighter. Okay, next up we've got one campus. Because that would make an impact. 
That would it it wouldn't make a great story. Thanks, one pass. Thank you. Sorry, I'm using up time. Well, it's, it's me. <laughs> yeah, it's your time. Yeah, I was going to ask you 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 to English lessons. I wish so much good shit. It's better than a plane. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't need to buy it. 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 We don't need to buy you want to, yeah, you want to go all, you know, Mediterranean cruise, dropping people off, you know, just kind of thing, persuading people at each port to. What's, what's the name of that? Saga or something. Saga. <laughs> Saga. <laughs> so many of them. Yeah, 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 we chartered the ship. Buy the tickets. How much is the ticket? <laughs> Marcus, and um, I'm going to present on uh, One Campus, um, which is uh, about multi-purpose reception centers within the member states. Um, I just want to stress from the beginning that it's really a, a joined up, um, it, it, it depends upon one pass and, and, and vice versa, because really the, the, the transit of large numbers of refugees, it, it requires, what is required of us in this time is to step forward and take responsibility. Um, and that means really across the board uh, and coming up with some holistic systems-based solutions um, that, are, that are coherent and comprehensive. And, and so One Campus is about integrating refugees once they arrive in EU member states. And we can do that to a really high standard. We have a lot of uh, infrastructure that is underused in this country and across Europe, not just land, but also buildings. So every local authority has buildings that are underused. Uh, every local church has capacity to host 50 to 100 refugees. I'm talking about every single parish in the country. Okay, So we, we have the capacity to, to really embrace um, the, the inflow of migrants, uh, which is happening. It's not going to go away. This is a long-term systemic problem that's going to define my lifetime and, and the lifetime of my son. You know, this is a big problem. Um, we, at the moment, a big problem is that there aren't any refugees here. I know there's a big outpouring of uh, willingness and support um, from, from people in this country, but how do we deal with it? We, we can send stuff to Calais, but it's not really a coherent systems-based solution. So for one campus to really thrive, we need one pass. We need to be able to move people safely from, from country of origin or, or from when they spill over borders. We need to be able to intervene uh, safely and transport them to the EU. And, and vice versa, one pass will become more effective uh, if, there are, uh, if there are reception centers. Uh, welcoming large inflows of migrants. So this is just about trying to change some of the dialogue, um, some of the starting a new conversation about refugees where we recognise that they are inherently value creators uh, and they are assets in any local economy. Um, they're not liabilities at all. So this is just a bit about the problem. We've heard a lot about this before. There's a lot of displaced people. There's a lot of refugees who have status as refugees. Um, 
uh, and then there's, a, there's, a, there's a, actually an awful lot, half a million, who entered the EU this year, but comparatively, that's not much. Uh, and we can do more as the European Union. With the wealthiest continent on the planet, we can do more to step forward into this breach and deal with the, deal with the problem that we face. Because you know, the, the quality of our lives depends on it as much as anything else. Um, our solution is uh, multi-purpose reception centers. So um, these would be based on existing local infrastructures, the kind of local infrastructure that every local parish has throughout the United Kingdom. Uh, we would supplement that with temporary event infrastructure where necessary. So especially during the winter, this cold winter that we're about to face, these large numbers of refugees who are stranded on the continent, um, they can be accommodated in, in places like the UK and other wealthy Western European nations. So um, we, can, we can use existing infrastructure, we can supplement that with the toilets, the kitchens, the showers that temporary events use, and it's largely redundant during the winter months. So this can be done with very low capital investment. Um, and it's also flexible and scalable, so it can be applied across the EU member states. How would it work? We start off with a handover over from one pass. This is self-nominating local communities. There's no obligation to do this, although there are going to be compulsory quotas in the next phase of this crisis. Uh, and we would interface with the one pass travel agency. So we would ensure the safe transit and then we would receive them in an accommodating way. We start out with a welcome process. There'd be a reception, health checks, legal consultation, in-country orientation, and a kind of welcome pack, giving them communications, giving them some spending money. Um, treating them like human beings, giving back them, them back their status. Um, and then we would place them within, within our campus. Um, this would look like an initial six week placement where um, you get basic training in language uh, and mentorship through your application process, which is still a really dangerous time for, for refugees that face a lot of homelessness during that period, even when they, their refugee status is, is, is guaranteed. We then transition to a, a longer period of rehabilitation and agile learning we have a core, core program which would um, really look to, 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 to upskill these refugees and, and, and also repurpose existing skills that they already have uh, and probably transition to hosting within the local community to further their integration within the local community. Um, we would look at local co-production as a, a way of uh, subsidizing this model, so engaging with the local authority and local community organizations to employ our undergraduates, our intakes, in the provision of local public services, which are about to be cut by 40% with this government in the next next four years, our local service is going to be cut by 40%. So something called co-production is going to be a really big part of the solution. And it's bubbling under in this country. It will happen. It hasn't really fed through yet. And this is a way of uh, recognizing that refugees can be a big part of this solution, actually. That's time. Okay. Sadly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe your question is, just, what's the rest of your presentation? <laughs> just just yeah. finally, that, that you know, we'd finish with, with local integration. So. We actually want to place graduates in the local economy um, you know, with jobs, with meaningful lives. And we figured out that the cost thing is affordable. We can, we can satisfy our initial investment per capita um, by taking something like 5% of the income. Uh, once, once a graduate has a job, they'd be able to pay back something like 5% of their income over two years. So it's a bit like a student loan, but a lot cheaper. Um, and then some milestones in terms of how we do that. I could talk a lot about how we'd actually do this because that's where my background specifically is in, how we would design and then deliver these infrastructures. But if there's a question about that, I can, <laughs> I can talk about it a little bit. Thank you. Just, so what's, what's the very, very next thing that you're going to do? So the, the first step is going to be um, a pilot scheme. We need to get a pilot scheme off the ground. So I actually have um, a very good relations with a, a very uh, innovative local council in Somerset, in Froome. So I know a lot of people in relation to that particular local community. I think we can get traction there very quickly. Um, but what we need to do is get buy-in from the local council, uh, and then we would move to a, a design process. So that would look like uh, over a 45-day period, we would run probably on alternate weekends insight sessions to map local stakeholders and understand their needs uh, and, and then we would probably do a hackathon methodology to really to really which is kind of what we've done done this weekend to really map out what is this what is this exemplar uh, reception center going to look like uh, and finally some capacity building workshop workshops because it's likely we discovered during that design process that we needed to learn some things we needed to build some capacity um, and I, rec I think uh, we probably need another 45 days to uh, to then set up uh, an exemplar 
an exemplar site, I, I think within 90 days we could be ready to receive our first intake. 90 days from now we'll be ready to receive our first intake. Oh. We talked about 30 or 40. We talked about 30. Yeah. I don't think, you know, it's scalable. And it, it depends a lot on the local infrastructure. This is not like a, a one model that's going to be applied everywhere. It's going to be something which is very flexible and scalable. But working with design principles and design methodology, you know, it's, it's something that's very much uh, modular and, and can be adapted to suit the local needs of people in place. Is there a financial um, commitment that you're looking forward to do that? I know. Yeah. Um, oh, we haven't got a slide for it. Yeah, there is. Um, we, we, we've, we've worked out that um, we probably need around about £20,000 to run the design process and another £20,000 to set up the, the, the exemplar campus. So those costs will actually fall by 50% um, the next time we did it. So there's quite a lot of work that um, we wouldn't need to duplicate in, 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 in the future applications because it's designed to be scaled, this model. And open um, source. And it's all open source, so it can, you know, there can be divergent tracks in terms of what people think is, is going to work best. But I think the first time we do it, we're looking at around about forty thousand pounds to get to the point where we can take in our, our intake. Um, I think at that stage, really, ideally, we'd be looking at local investment. So in the first first phase, we'd be looking for some seed investment around about forty thousand pounds, and then we would go to local investment because the the legal model would look like a kind of holding company, uh, maybe the one home. Uh, set up as an LLP, but then lots of different subsidiary local organizations because what we really want to do is empower refugees as stakeholders and also the local actors who are contributing to this model. So they would actually have an economic stakeholding in the project, in the campus. They'd be alumni in the, in the most meaningful sense of the, of the word. Good. Thank you. Um. Sorry. So I, there is no PowerPoint for this one, um, but one story basically is I would say is the concept about bringing the human back to the story, the human story, and finding a single narrative of how we can articulate, send this message across, and tell the story the best through the refugees' lens and kind of why we're doing what we're doing, what drives us, and so it's a whole PR campaign about it, and writing, filming videos, articles, and all that goes with that. So that's where one story comes into play, and it's about time to get all together, and um, yeah, we're excited to be doing that. So it's all our voices, Ahmed's voice, and anyone else we can get, and uh, that's about it. So there's nothing skilled yet, but um, it's not that technical, so I think it's it's very self-explanatory, so that's very good. Yeah. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> but we have four hours left. Four, we have four hours left, yeah. At least you get a group photo. <laughs> we'll definitely get a group photo. Yeah. So, so nice. just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I do need to... You need to go, Yeah, not that I'm, you know, the important person here, but... Just so in terms of going forward, yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to take these five ideas, um, for want of a better word, um, do you have a better word? Different ideas. Or initiatives. If, yeah, initiatives. We're going to um, create a, a sort of environment over here where the uh, platform will be able to pitch them to people, organizations that will hopefully Uh, but great, I'm very inspired, I would say. I, um, the one that's got me is the ship, I'm afraid. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, because it seems to me that on the ship so many of the other things can happen. And it's also a fantastic story. A fantastic story. Uh, it's been done before and it works. Um, so, yeah. Great. So I applaud you. Thank you for making your space available to us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll be, we'll, we'll be here on Monday. Catch up. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Right. So, um, before closing then, Dan, I'm just going to. Yeah. So, yeah, firstly, I just want to acknowledge all of you for coming out, getting up early on uh, Saturday morning, being here uh, across the last nearly 36 hours. 
and um, it takes a special kind of human being to do that. Like you care, and uh, I see that and I acknowledge that. This idea came together literally in a, in a week's time. Uh, we normally put a lot more rigor around the planning of these these hackathons, but uh, we came together and we worked hard, and we've um, actually involved a real refugee in the process, which is so rare to actually listen to uh, the needs of uh, somebody in a, in a design and a consultative process like this. And I'm really proud of what we've all accomplished. And I also want to just share that this is part of a series of events. We're going to be taking things towards them. We're already in negotiation with other cities about doing a multi-city uh, version of the of the One Home uh, initiative. So thank you all. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Klaus. Making it happen. Just else who helped to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not not me, but just like as a species. <laughs> 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 uh, More hacking.